I wanted to take a moment to introduce Manon and Amy. Um, so Manon started gardening in 2005 when her daughter asked her a question and she didn't know the answer. And so she's been looking for answers ever since and sharing them with her community with great joy and verb. Um, she studied seed saving with um, a Ketchum local Bill McDormand who started high altitude seeds. Some of you may know Bill and know high altitude. Um, she's a master gardener. She helped found uh, Valley Valley Victory Gardens, which I think she'll probably talk about a little bit more. And she has taught many classes locally um, over the years and now has her own YouTube gardening channel, um, which I'm sure she'll mention as she goes along. Um, Amy is the co-director of the Wood River Seed Library. Um, she's the co-director of the Local Food Alliance, which is a program of the Sun Valley Institute. And she serves on the Blaine County Food Council. Uh, she's a board member of the Idaho Center for Sustain Sustainable Agriculture, and she's worked with many organizations locally involved in the local food movement, including Idaho's Bounty, Nourish Me, and Craig's Market and Garden. So our growing season here is very different from other parts of the country. Um, especially from the south of the country. We have a very short season. Uh, some people in North Valley only have, uh, technically speaking, a 30-day uh, season between two frosts. Um, here in Haley, I have about 60 days, and some people have 90 days. There are different uh, microclimates in the region. But the basically in summary we have a very short season growing season and we have extreme fluctuations between day and night and we have to deal with wind and which is very drying and cooling and on top of that we have all kinds of wildlife and pests so we have quite a few challenges however we are willing and uh, actually our valley offers a better climate for cold season plants than for warm season plants and actually it's easier in here to do cold season plants than southern idaho because at some point it gets too hot there and here we still have we have cold season uh, longer than in the south so in, in the South Valley here, like in Haley and uh, south up here, we can actually grow both cold season vegetables and warm season vegetables with season extenders. And we have to get accustomed to daily weather monitoring. Monitoring, sorry, with my French. And, But if you live in uh, Ketchum or north of Ketchum, you're, you may be able to grow cold season vegetables, but growing warm season vegetables uh, up in Ketchum is not easy. It's doable. Some people are doing it, but it's, it's more of a challenge. So here are listed the different crops that are considered cool season vegetables and warm season vegetables. And you can go back to that in, in the slides after. So quickly, I'm going to go quickly over the first few slides. Uh, so we have time to spend on, on the extensions uh, themselves. But one bit of wisdom is we have to choose uh, varieties that are adapted to our climate. If you try to grow a seed that is not adapted to a climate, like you could you can grow a tomato here, but why not choose the seeds that are adapted to cold nights, right? So we, we grow, um, there's a group of seed savers in our valley and we harvest seeds from our tomatoes and we distribute them for free with, with our fellow gardeners. And these seeds are adapted to our climate. So that's what we should aim for. We should aim for seeds that are adapted because they've been harvested here or harvested in other, another climate that has the same altitude, the same weather. We have to plan ahead. 
Um, one thing very important, because we, we have challenges, we need the best possible soil. So we need a very fertile soil. We need to spend some effort making sure that we have a good soil, which, you know, if you're living in California or other areas that have fertile soil and good weather to start with, you don't have to spend so much uh, effort on soil. But here we, we have to consider what we can do to improve the soil fertility. We have to know our climate. So I have to know what climate there is here in Haley, for example, but I also within my own property, there are different areas of my property that are warmer than others. If you have a septic tank above your septic system, your soil is warmer. Uh, areas that are protected uh, close to the house will, will be warmer. So you have to know your own, you have to define your own microclimates around your house and reserve the spaces that are the warmest for your warm season vegetables. We have to protect from wind, from hail, from frost, as well as from, you know, little critters, big and small. Um, it's a very dry climate, so we have to protect from scorching of intense sun and we have to water consistently. And we need to provide uh, pollinator friendly flowers, but that's not limited to us. Everybody has to do that if we want our tomatoes to be pollinated. So timing uh, concerns. We plant cool season crops as early as possible. For example, the peas go in the ground as soon as the ground is thawed out. We can put our peas in the ground, but then we have to protect them. We have to protect them from frost. The peas won't die if it snows on them or if there's a frost, but they will grow faster if you protect them and keep the, the warmth. Um, for some cold season vegetables and for warm season wet vegetables, we have to start our seeds indoor. And then we harden them, we acclimate them to the outdoors, and then we transplant them outside. And then we need to protect them. And we'll talk about that. And you can do a second planting of cold season crops in the fall, especially the leafy greens. You can plant them in August so that they will grow again in the fall. But your cold season vegetables will not like to grow in July. It's too hot for them in July. And Unless you have a microclimate that has shade or a cooler area or you're in North Valley where you can grow those cooler season crops year round, just to throw that in there for North Valley people or shady people like in Delaview neighborhood, I think is a great example of where you might have a South Valley garden where you have enough shade that you could grow successfully lettuces, kale, spinach all um, summer long in a shady spot. So just going to yeah. throw that in for people. There's yeah. a little hope still. Yeah. Yeah. And at the end of the season, we have to protect from frost. So this is about, you know, seed starting indoors. And then um, uh, timing issues also. In October, in the fall, I stock up on all my seed starting things, the soil, the compost, and all the supplies I need because I start my seeds in January, if I start onions in February and March, if I start cold season vegetables indoor, and in April, if I start my tomatoes. But in January, uh, don't try to get these seed starting things from the garden centers, they're closed, right? So stock up in the, in the fall. Uh, in the fall, we also prepare our beds for the next season. So we clean our beds, we loosen up the soil, add compost and add lots of mulch. And fall is also a good time to seed your perennial flowers like echinacea and um, hollyhocks and other perennial flowers and flower bulbs it's a good idea to plant them in the fall 
my tulips, and your garlic uh, goes in the ground in the fall after nights have started to freeze, but before the ground actually freezes. So let's talk about how, what do I mean by best fertile soil. So the soil has to be well aerated, not compacted, it has to be loose enough. The acidity has to be adapted to the plants you're growing. In general, our soils are too alkaline, but there are areas where it's not so. So you have to know your, your own soils and there are meters you can use or soil tests you can use to uh, check that. Uh, you want a lot of microbes in your soil, a lot of diversity and a lot of a big quantity of microbes in your soil. And you want a lot of organic matter. Organic matter provides the microbiome and it also provides a buffer that keeps the moisture in the ground. And it's, uh, the organic matter is, is a good habitat for all the the microbiome and for all of the nutrient transfers from the soil to the plant. Uh, you want to have a lot of compost in your ground, manure. You need good drainage, good moisture retention, and we do that with lots of compost, lots of organic matter, uh, including peat moss. Um, to have a fertile soil, you could use techniques like the Hugo culture bed, which is basically decomposing uh, tree trunks or branches that you cover up with all kinds of things, with soil and all kinds of compostable materials. And I encourage everyone to make their own compost because it's difficult to find good compost on the market. So make your own compost as much as you can. So the next thing we have to do, the next smart is to optimize the nutrient level for each stage of each plant. So we, for each plant, we have to know what they need at each stage. And I don't want to spend too much time on this right now, but you, you know, can- We do have a question about who performs soil pH tests around here. Okay, well, if you call the uh, extension office, the University of Idaho extension office, they will give you, they will tell you all you need to do, how to do a soil test and where to send it. And they have a probe that you can uh, borrow from them. And you just send your soil test in the mail and it comes back to you. I think it's being sent to Twin Falls. Mm -hmm. And I think the last time I heard it was around $40 to do a soil test. And then somebody else just made a comment that they bought a pH soil tester at a local garden center for less than $20. So that's another option too. Yeah, there are different kinds of kits to test the soil. And there's also, a, it's like a, a big thermometer that you just poke in the soil and it tells you what the pH is. It's not as precise as a soil test done in a lab, but it's worthwhile. Yeah, if anyone's ever tested their own pH, I would say like I bought one of the little, it's almost like a little plastic container where you put some soil in there, you shake it up with water, and then you look at um, a color scale, right? Because you're adding in this thing that reacts to the pH level, and then it represents a specific color on the pH scale. I personally find it really hard to determine the difference between six and seven or seven and eight. So I think that if you're you know, most of our soil is probably in between five and eight. So when you're looking at something that close, it's really helpful to get that lab confirmation. So you know exactly what pH you're actually at versus like everyone's blue or green looks a tiny bit different. So it's really hard to know, am I at six and a half? Am I at seven and a half? And that can be all the difference for certain crops. So as much as it's nice to go cheap and easy where you can test it at your own, it's not going to be as on point as sending it to a lab. Yeah, and the lab will also tell you um, how much calcium you have in the soil, nitrogen, iron. Um, it's just, it's kind of like reading a back of a multivitamin bottle. Mm -hmm. um, but you see how your particular garden is doing, and you know that it, you might need to add more 
you know, calcium or something. Uh, but anyway, it's a, it's a great uh, window into, the, into your own soil. Right. Thank you. So the microclimates. We need to, um, I, I, I highly recommend using a soil thermometer to test your soil early in the spring. And you'll be surprised what the, the difference of soil temperatures uh, in different areas, depending on how much sunshine you get at what time of day. And whether you're close to the river or not, or whether you're close to a wall or not. So whether you're exposed to the cold air coming from a canyon or not. Mm -hmm. On one side of the house, it could be really cold. The other side could be warm because it's protected from that draft. So um, it's worth using a soil thermometer. It's not very expensive. It's, it's about a foot long and, and that's really precise. And so use your thermometer to define your temperatures and choose areas that will, will be most protective and warmest for your warm season vegetables. And for your cold veg vegetables, cold season vegetables, you want them to be in part shade, that's fine, part, part sun, part shade. You want them to be actually protected from the west sunshine that could be scorching for them, especially later on in the season. Um, and you can warm up your soil fast. You can thaw it faster in the spring by laying plastic on the ground on your beds or on, on your raised beds or on your soil. And you can warmer the soil with warm water to warm it up faster and to keep it warm. Like if you have, a, if there's a cold spell and you know this plant doesn't like to be, to go below a certain temperature, like tomatoes don't like to go below 45 degrees. But if you keep the feet of the plant warm with warm water, they will be happier. So that's, it's worth uh, doing that, at, you know, in the spring and in the fall using warm water. Uh, you can store water in barrels or in bucket, buckets that the, so, uh, the sunshine can uh, warm up. Plus it lets the chlorine evaporate if you have chlorine in your water. And you can align your garden beds east-west with a slight incline facing south because the sun is never you know, at the top of the sky. It's always at a little incline. So if, if you slightly incline your beds, you're, um, you're optimizing the sunshine or the warmth. And we use different structures to create microclimates or to define our microclimates. Things close to a wall or to a fence, um, usually that's, it's warmer. The, the walls reflect the heat to the plant. And they also, a wall, if it's a cement or, or uh, bricks, it actually accumulates heat. And then it s sends it out in the evening when it's colder. And both fences and walls will protect from the wind, which is cold and dry. Uh, trees and shrubs are a good way of creating a windbreak. Stones, if you have stones and bricks uh, around your garden, you know, around, if you have a bed and you, you have a line of stones and bricks around your, your bed, it, it adds more heat. Raised beds warm up faster than the ground in, in, the, in the spring. So it's an asset to have raised beds. And you can create hot beds. A hot bed is like you, you dig a pit in the soil and you put manure in there, a manure that is not fully decomposed because it's highly active. The, there's a microbial activity that was, will generate heat. So you, put, you dig a pit, you put manure in there, you cover that with your fertile soil and you grow in that fertile soil. And the microbial activity of, of, your, of the manure 
will, will generate heat for one season. And then you can have cold frames and I have a few pictures of that. Uh, what's a cold frame? You can have greenhouses, tunnels. So on this picture, you see a, there's a wall of bricks and then there's a, a windbreak of shrubs behind and tall trees. And there's also some raised beds in there. Here, this is a, a, a hot bed with straw bale. The straw bale, the straw itself has a lot of ba bacterial activity. So the straw generates heat and then you put manure at the bottom of this uh, raised bed with the soil on top. And I know some people who are using that to grow tomatoes in Ketchum. And there are smaller devices you can use. One that we have to use as much as we can is mulch. Mulch is anything that will cover your soil so that your soil does not dehydrate and it also retains the moisture. Yeah, it retains the moisture and it also retains the heat in the soil when the air is, gets colder than the soil. So mulch can be your grass cuttings, it could be uh, straw, it can be uh, wood mulch, but we have to be careful with wood mulch because it, it kind of takes the nitrogen off out of the ground. So uh, we have to put it on top of the ground and not too, too close to the plants, but that's also a good mulch. And there's also plastic mulch, paper mulch. All, there are all kinds of manufactured mulch you can use. Another device that we use a lot here in the Valley is row covers. It's a kind of a garden fabric. It's very light. It's white. It lets the air through. It lets the sunshine through. It protects from the bugs, but it, it helps retain the moisture and it helps uh, retain the heat. Shade cloth is, is a specialized cloth, but you can use, you can use um, a row cover as a shade cloth also. Um, we use hoops and stakes so you can lay your shade cloth or your row covers on top of it. But you can also lay your row cover directly on your plants or directly on, on the soil before the plants, before the seedlings come up. There are clushes and cones. There are different devices. I have some pictures of that. Um, they're individual, individual protectors for plants. Wallow water also is an individual protector. It's, it's like a, a plastic ton, a plastic cylinder that you fill with water. The walls of the cylinder can be filled with water and that adds an additional protection, especially if you fill it with warm water in the evening. Um, I use a lot of chicken wire around my plants to protect them from the little critters and the big ones. And also growing in containers uh, is, a, is a nice uh, way of dealing with uh, extension, season extension. The nice thing about containers is some of them you can bring indoors or in your garage at times and you can create towers. So here, there's, there's little, little devices, easy devices. You take a jug of uh, milk, you cut off the bottom, and it becomes a, a protector for a plant. Or a cylinder, here I have a cylinder around the pea plant and two jugs. There's an image of a cold frame so a cold frame is a wood box. Usually it's wood, not necessarily, but oftentimes it's wood. And it has a lid, a clear lid that lets the sun shine through. It can be glass or polycarbonate or even a plastic sheeting. And you can see on the right, there's a little arm here that opens up the top of my cold frame. 
when it gets too warm in there because any greenhouse or any cold frame, if it gets too hot in there, it will cook your plants real quick. So you don't want that to happen and you're not always next to your box to open the lid. So it's really handy to have this little device. It's, I think it was around $30. It's not very expensive <clears throat> and it's hydraulic. There's no electricity. It just, there's a liquid in it. And it, when the liquid expands by heat, it opens it up. And when it contracts, it closes the lid. Works really well. On the front left, the bottom left here, you see I have uh, some burlap covering my plants. That's another, burlap is under the, another garden fabric that I use a lot of. And here you see some containers. Again, I've covered them with burlap to protect them. And there's a little tunnel here made with, there's some hoops covered with the garden fabric. This one, the brand name of this one is Agribon. And you can buy it by the yard or by the package or by the roll. And they, this fabric lasts a long time. And um, also at times when, when there's a big frost, I cover with plastic on top of the fabric. So each layer of fabric or plastic gives you four degrees of protection. So here's another kind of cover that you can buy or, or make. It's all plastic over a raised bed. There's another cold frame here at the bottom. It's all polycarbonate. And you see they use uh, concrete blocks to frame a, a raised bed. So the, the concrete blocks are warm, or keep, keep the warmth. And uh, container gardening is, is a great way also of dealing with, you know, having to bring your plants in and out instead of covering them. You can even grow carrots in containers. Okay, sunlight. Most vegetables require at least six to eight hours of sunlight, but some uh, need only five to six hours of sunlight. But we have to be careful about the, the sun when it gets too hot, especially our west sun. Um, so you may want to provide shade either by trees or fabric on the west side of your plants. And that's as far as I'm going to go in my presentation slide. There are more slides here. You can look at them on your own if you want. But I'd rather answer questions or get to the other parts of the presentation. Well, um, let's, uh, anybody have any questions for Manon or Amy um, in terms of what, what's been covered so far? Here's one. When should you mulch, mulch? Whoops. <laughs> that was my cat. <laughs> oh, that's great. I, I think you should mulch anytime, all the time. Um, <laughs> I do a lot of green mulching. So I have some plants like comfrey that whenever they just start to have a lot of leaf growth, I chop them and I put them on the ground over my soil. So I pretty much mulch year round all the time. Yeah, you never want to leave your fertile soil bare because it, it cooks the, it dehydrates the soil pretty fast if it's not covered. And if it's dehydrated, it's, it kills your microbiome and you want to keep it as alive as you want, as you can. You want to keep the moisture in there and you want to avoid the compaction also. Once it's dehydrated, it would compact more. So keep it yeah. mulched all the time. 
it, the mulch also helps to buffer the heat during the day, which I know it's like counterintuitive. How can mulch do so many different cool things? But if the sun's not hitting the soil directly, it's not warming up as much during the day, but it is staying warmer during the night. So it's really great across the board of helping your soil just maintain a better equilibrium. I see a question about a pine tree and pH. The, the pine trees, the, the pine needles create an acidic soil. So near your pine tree will be, it will be acidic. And you can even use the pine needles as a mulch if you need an acidic bed. For example, to grow blueberries or any kind of berry, they like acidic soils. So I don't know if that answers your question. So Amy, you may want to show your greenhouse now. Yeah, sure. So I, as you can tell, um, my background has changed a little bit. So I'm outside in our greenhouse and I'll just give people a little bit of a background story on this. So I've been gardening in this little lot on my home in Haley and for four years now. And when we got here, it was just like a wee lot. So we quickly kind of built out a garden and we have a lot of perennials and I want to grow food year round because I like to eat fresh food. So last year, um, I'm going to flip it around now and show you the outside, like from the front view. So basically we had these garden beds outside our kitchen window. This is our kitchen in here. Um, and we decided let's build a greenhouse around this. So we keep these windows open into our home all winter long. And we have a, we only have a wood stove heat in our home. So we're able to kind of share the heat here, but then I'm going to walk you over. I'm going to turn my fountain on. So as you can see, we have this copper piping on the cement floor, and this is a little hot water heater from our camper. So it's an old hot water heater, and we have it set up so that the water will come through here. Um, this was originally here, and we added this whole part onto it. Um, so my husband did the piping in the sand and put tile on it. So all winter long, we keep stuff growing. For instance, I've been harvesting and eating delicious borage flowers all winter long. Our parsley that we were harvesting from all winter flowered. Um, it's been feeding the bees, which is really nice. You can see we have windows that you can open. So a lot of bugs come in and out of here, which is great. But then this is a water trough. So ideally this holds hot water all night long and is also creating humidity in here just to keep the warmth up. So we see about 50% humidity in here and the coldest it got during the winter time this year, I think was 38 degrees. Um, we added this this spring where it's our seed starting setup and we actually really like it because as you can imagine, the heat overnight is evaporating off here and warming. These are tomatoes, these are peppers, so it's really keeping our soil nice and warm. And then I have cooler season stuff up here that'll be transplanted out. So that's our little garden. Um, we used a lot of scraps from job sites. My husband's in construction. We did buy the plastic at Home Depot. You can see it on here. It's just a layer of plastic. And then this is on for um, the winter time to help with that extra la layer of insulation. And we have that window up high for heat. And we'll probably put a fan up there as it gets hotter to keep the air moving. Like today it was 82 in here mm -hmm. because it is just so warm outside. But it's been really fun um, because we were just kind of playing around to see if it actually worked this winter. We had a lot of kinks. We had to get a better pump for our water to stay going. We had to like find the right temperatures and just make find that equilibrium. So this coming winter, we plan on having kale and lettuces and Swiss chard and spinach all winter long, as well as some of the herbs. So you can see here, like I have my rosemary plant and this is thyme. I also keep my worm bin in here, which is really great. Um, and this is probably the most exciting part. We had a bunch of strawberry runners that we potted up last fall and transplanted them this spring. So we are officially eating homegrown strawberries right now. 
um, just the beginning of spring. And I planted radishes in here a couple weeks ago. So, and then I do because we feed bugs here. I have like nasturtium flowers going. I'm allowing my kale that overwintered to bloom right now, which is really nice. So this is our little ecosystem greenhouse. And I hope that just maybe inspires people to think outside of the box and get creative on ways that they can make their own living spaces work for them. Because for me, I literally sit out here all winter long and read and it's heaven. Our listeners are applauding you. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. I appreciate that. Uh, my husband really made it all come together, which is a blessing for me because I couldn't have done it on my own, but it's been it's my beautiful little, it's like my lady cave, I guess you could call it. <laughs> Spend a lot of time in here. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to share this with everybody. It's pretty incredible. So I, I imagine that there's a really smart person out there. I'm going to go off video as I walk back in my house, but who could actually figure out, you know, the physics behind it and like what scale could you do that on? I imagine it's infinite. If you had hot water heaters and piping to make the floors warm, you could really do that at a commercial scale or at a small scale like I have, which is awesome. Awesome. Well, so you're, you're getting a yeah. lot of comments. People are saying your greenhouse is awesome. So uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Love to see your greenhouse. It's inspiring. So <laughs> Aww, thank you all so much. I'd be happy to have everyone over. Um, <laughs> I will say that my garden is a jungle in the summertime. So it's really fun for people, I think, to see different types of gardens. So I'm happy to anyone who likes things to go wild. Please come see this this summer because <laughs> it is wild. <laughs> And the greenhouse will be wild. I, I think we're going to have some tomato plants that grow up. And ideally, I'm going to try to get tomatoes to stay. I'll plant some later in the summer and hope that I can get like cherry tomatoes, maybe in all winter long. We'll see. Cool. Yeah, just fun to play around and experiment. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amy. So now I think Kristen will talk about carrots, right? Yeah, let me see if I can uh, pull this off. Hold on just a second. Kristen grows a lot of carrots and she keeps them in the soil. Let's and see. she's now eating fresh carrots out of the soil that she kept in her ground until now. So hold on, let me try that again. Let me see if I can. I can do, whoops, that's not going to work. Ah, sorry. Okay, we'll try that again. All right. Okay, so um, for some reason or other, it's not showing my first slide. There we go. Um, so, I'll just, this is a teaser. These are the carrots I dug up from my garden in March, it was. So, it's okay. So why overwinter? Can you guys see that okay? Yes, yes, we okay. do. I was thinking it could be a big screen, but I'm not, I'm not sure I can do that. How did, did you just do, start from beginning then all? Just like a regular PowerPoint? I, I was not in PowerPoint, but you can oh. say full, if you say full screen, it will show it bigger. Okay, I'm, you, gonna, I'm gonna try. Or if you have a play button, but we, we see it anyway. Yeah, we okay. can try it. So, no, I, so I'm particularly interested in, so many, many years ago, I decided that I wanted to see if I could feed myself as much as possible throughout the year. So. Um, you know, I started growing really good storage onions. I started growing winter squash, you know, potatoes, um, freezing things. Um, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, I knew that you could overwinter some kale, but that was, it was years and years ago and it was before the whole tunnel phenomena. I just didn't know about that. So, um, but I did hear that you could overwinter carrots and I thought, well, that's interesting. So, so why would you want to overwinter some of your veggies? Well, for gardeners like us, it extends your gardening season, so you can kind of do it all year round if you don't have a greenhouse. 
Um, you actually get to eat fresh veggies throughout the winter. And some veggies just taste better after they've been frosted. So the veggies I'm talking about are these three. Um, parsnips on the left, carrots in the middle, and beets on the right hand side. And you might look at those beets and say, those are funny looking beets. Um, and most beets you'll see are kind of pretty much round shape. But this is a variety called Solyndra. And I have a very small garden and I like to get as much out of it as I possibly can. So the Solyndra variety grows down like a carrot. And so I can really plant them pretty intensely. And their, their greens are great, the beets themselves are great. So, so what I'm gonna be talking about are parsnips, carrots, and beets. And I hope you can plant some of your beets back in the ground and let them go to seed. They go to seed the second year. So take your best three uh, beets, replant them in the soil now, and let them go to seed, please. So carrots, parsnips, and beets are biennials, which um, is what Manal is just talking about. So um, most garden vegetables are more or less annual. So you plant the seed in the spring, it grows during the summer, you harvest it in the fall or throughout the summer and into the fall. Um, and you do that with carrots, parsnips, and beets too. But if you are a carrot or a parsnip or a beet, what you really wanna do is produce seeds. So the first year, um, these three vegetables will produce their long roots, which is where they store sugars and carbohydrates. Um, and then the next year, like Manal said, they will grow a green shoot, they'll flower and they'll seed. So that's important to think about as you're trying to overwinter um, these three vegetables. So um, I've used a bunch of different kinds of carrots. Uh, lately, I've sort of settled on Danvers Half Long and Scarlet Nantes for carrots. Um, I like heirloom vegetables. These were developed in the mid 1800s, um, which is pretty cool. Um, the cylinder beets that I mentioned to you. And then um, I've used different kinds of parsnips right now. I'm using the gladiator parsnip and it, it seems fine. So um, one tip is in your garden, um, plant them next to each other so that when you mulch them for winter, you don't, you don't have to have a patch over here that you're mulching, a patch over here that you're mulching and a patch over there that you're mulching. So I always plant them right next to each other. Plus then you, when you're harvesting them, you can just kind of get some beets and get some parsnips and get some carrots all at the same time. So Mena did a great job of talking about how to help grow healthy plants. So we're assuming that you're at the end of the growing season, more or less. Um, you want to keep your soil moist, but not wet. Um, and this is right up until you mulch it. And I've even pulled the mulch up and rewatered it because you don't want that soil to dry out, but you don't want it to be wet either. So keeping the soil moist. And then after we get a season ending frost, which, well, last year was the first week of September, which really sucked. Um, but usually it's in October. Um, but you need some several season ending frosts that will take out your tomatoes and your peppers and that sort of stuff. So that's when you're starting to think about um, uh, mulching these root vegetables. You don't want to mulch them too soon because if you, and I'll go into the details of the mulching, but um, you don't want to do it too soon because that mulch can act like a greenhouse and it'll, it'll be warm just, just like Amy's greenhouse. She was saying it was 80 degrees there today. Well, if, it, if the outside temperatures uh, get too warm, then you, that mulch becomes like a blanket in the wrong way over those root crops. So you don't want to do it too soon. You know, I thought I screwed up last year because we had that early frost and I kept wanting to mulch one and I never got around to it. And I thought, oh, the shoulders of the carrots are going to be frozen. This is going to be a problem, but it wasn't. So, um, so you get them mulched and then you get the joy of going out there in the middle of the winter or wait until early spring and harvesting these sweet, crisp carrots and delicious parsnips and beets because all of those vegetables um, are better once they've gotten a hard frost. And I, I would say even better if you um, uh, overwinter them. So this is how you do it. So you see my carrots, you see the ground. Um, so I've used different techniques for layering um, and layering is really the key. 
uh, what seems to work the most recently what the you know how gardeners are always experimenting but this is my new favorite um, I have some leftover landscape fabric that Manal was talking about um, that was just a it was kind of an odd size it was too thin and didn't really cover much of anything um, and so I I put that directly over the carrot well I'll just say carrots instead of all three vegetables I do the treatments the same for all three of them um, I don't cut the leaves off I just put that landscape fabric over it kind of over the edges too um, I, I grow in in beds slightly raised beds so um, and then this is the key part so the what the landscape fabric does is it um, it so landscape, I, I misspoke. The landscape fabric I'm thinking about is that black landscape fabric um, that you use to keep weeds out. So it lets moisture in and humidity out. Um, so there's a, that opportunity to breathe. Um, but I've used sheets. I wouldn't recommend sheets, but you could. But just something to keep your mulch off your vegetables so that you can, when you're pulling that layer off to get to your vegetables, it, it isn't messy. So your landscape fabric or some sort of breathable um, fabric. And then the next layer is your mulch. And for many years, I used four to six inches of straw. Um, it was accessible. I could get it. It was cheap. Um, but I really I have a small garden. And I found that straw is um, it's just kind of messy. Uh, as much as I like it for other things, it's just kind of messy. And I didn't have straw last fall. So what I ended up doing was using multiple layers of frost cloth. And, and this is the frost cloth that um, Manal was talking about early, the Agrabon. Um, I had this strange shaped strip. And so I just, I layered it up about five or six times right over those plants. And then on top of it, you want a waterproof layer because you, you want the plants and the soil to breathe but you don't want the snow to seep down into it because it really raises havoc. And then the last thing that you, we can do nothing about is pray for snow because snow is your great insulator. And um, since I've grown at this particular garden here in Bellevue, um, you know, we've had as little as six to eight inches on the ground. It seemed to do just fine. And I'll show you some pictures. Um, a couple of years ago, we had three feet on the ground, and that did just fine too. So, um, so let me show you some pictures. So this was in 2017. Um, we had a lot of snow in 2017. That fence is about three feet tall. So I went out twice to harvest um, my crop crops, uh, once in January and once in the early spring. And I don't know if you can see it, but you can kind of see my footprints heading out to the uh, uh, where my carrots and parsnips and stuff uh, uh, are. And then on the left-hand picture, um, I've shoveled the snow off the top surface. Uh, I'm pulling that blue tarp, waterproof tarp off. And then there is the straw. And then in the right-hand picture, I've removed the straw. Um, I've pulled um, that bottom layer, that, that breathing layer off my crop. Uh, I've dug the, the root veggies up with my digging fork, which I'll tell you, I wouldn't want to do this without a digging fork. I would highly recommend a digging fork. It's one of the greatest tools for a gardener. Um, and that, like I say, that was the first time I um, uh, went out and harvested that particular crop, but that was using straw. Um, and then this was last year. I actually didn't go out in the middle of the winter like I usually did. Um, and most of the snow had melted off, except in my shady areas, those little microclimates that Menno was talking about earlier. And I was really concerned that, um, that it had gotten so warm that those plants would have started to produce green shoots. Um, however, I dug them up and there they are right there. So, um, uh, they were in great shape. They had started, you can see a few little green sprouts coming out of them. Um, uh, you, because remember, the root is where the, the, the root crops are holding their carbohydrates and their sugar. And so the plant wants to use those carbohydrates and sugar to produce the growth for that second year. 
So you don't want them to start thinking that it's time to produce growth for that second year, that new green shoot. Um, so this was, it surprised me. Um, uh, it, it, I thought, I thought they'd be further along and, and uh, you know, have started to pull those sugars um, out, but, uh, but they ended up being okay. So, um, so then I dig them up, I bring them in, um, I wash them. Uh, I don't scrub them hard, uh, but I soak them a little bit and I rub the dirt off. Um, and then um, I, these are the two different kinds of scarlet nantes on the um, left hand with a kind of pointed tips and the Danvers half long on the right side with the blunt tips. And uh, so I, I, I soak them in water. I rub the soil off because I've, I've learned that if you leave the soil on, um, the soil can tend to mold and I don't want that. Um, so I rub the, the soil gently off, you know, rinse it, and then I lay it out so the carrots can dry, so they're not wet. And then I take a garbage bag uh, or a grocery bag, put a couple layers of paper towels in the bottom, put my carrots in on top, and then put a couple more layers of paper towels, and that, those paper towels absorb any extra um, moisture and they also provide humidity for the carrots so they tend not to dry out. Um, and then uh, I wanted to point out the scarlet nantes on the left. Uh, I, this was really surprising. I pulled, I took this picture, I don't know, maybe a month ago, something like that. And they were harvested at the same time, same growing conditions, but you can see that the nantes on the left have already started to send roots out little rootlets out from their orange root. Um, and you really don't want that to happen because as those roots are growing, they're pulling that the sugar, um, which is what makes carrots taste good. Um, they're pulling that sugar out of the orange root. Um, so that was just an interesting thing for me to learn that scarlet nantes, they start to um, send out their little secondary roots much sooner than the Danvers half long on the right hand side. But um, uh, so let's see, I think that's, and then just enjoy. Let's see. And I just wanted to show you, I have a, a volunteer carrot right here, but I just want to, geez. Whoops. I thought it was just going to snap, but it's, it's not. I wanted you to hear the snap because they're just so there. They're just uh, crisp and fresh and um, very sweet this time of year. Um, and then I wanted to just throw one other thing in about season extenders. Um, I planted uh, asparagus a few years ago. And uh, this is the asparagus that I harvested. This is the first cutting of the asparagus um, that I harvested just this morning. Um, so uh, as we're thinking about extending uh, our harvest, um, there were some wonderful ideas shared from, you know, at the beginning of the season, uh, greenhouses, overwintering vegetables, and selecting vegetables um, like asparagus that it's a perennial. And it just comes up right now and you can eat fresh vegetables from your garden. I could have harvested a couple days ago, but I, but I didn't. So, um, so I think that's it for me. Were, were there any, um, any questions here? Um, I don't see any new question in the chat. Ah, so yeah, somebody asked a question about hoping the ground is not frozen. You know, unless you get bitterly, bitterly cold temperatures, and I'm talking about like 10 to 20 below, um, the, as long as there's snow on the ground, the ground generally doesn't freeze, um, which is very interesting. Um, that snow insulates so well, and there's so much thermal mass in the earth um, that it, that heat, we wouldn't really call it heat, but the earth calls it heat. It rises because heat rises. Um, and so for the most part, if you have a good snow cover, um, your ground won't freeze. Uh, 
the reason I mulch, I mean, you might be able to just let the snow mulch your, your carrots and beets. Um, but the reason I do is, um, I think it was Amy, either Amy or Manon was, were talking earlier about moderating that temperature where you don't want it to get too warm or too cool. And so that mulch just, just helps keep that temperature, um, uh, it just moderates it. Um, and then somebody says, after harvesting, do I keep them in the fridge? Yep, that's it. they're in the fridge. This, this one was in the fridge. Yep. As cold as, cold as possible. You know, as, as, cold, as cold as you can to freezing level, not frozen, but... The yeah, I just stick them in the crisper. So. And then, um, do I treat asparagus the same as carrots? No, they're entirely different. Um, they're, uh, I want to say... I wanted to say that they're a kind of grass, but they may not be a grass. Um, but no, they're, they're a perennial plant. You can have asparagus plants that are 40 years old. Um, uh, and so you just plant them in the ground. They have a, there's a certain way that you do it. Um, and then they just, they grow from that crown. Each year they grow up and you cut them at the crown. They keep trying to produce and you cut them at the crown and they keep trying to produce and you cut them at the crown. And then at a certain point, you let them, um, those, those green shoots go up and the, because the plant needs to photosynthesize. Um, and it produces flowers and it produces fruits and it does what all plants do at the end of, or most plants do at the end of the year, so. And I want to go back to the question about um, mulching and the ground not freezing. One reason why the ground doesn't freeze around the carrots is the microbial activity. There are, you know, these vegetables are sweet and there, there's a lot of microbial. In the, mi in the microbiome class, I explained that each plant creates a microbial kingdom around them. <laughs> There, there's a microbial activity that is getting maintained and that activity warms up the soil, mm -hmm. prevents it from freezing to us. So yes, the mulching, but if you mulch a soil that doesn't have any vegetable in it, it might freeze depending on how much, depending on what kind of mulch you're using and whether your mulch creates enough bacterial activity to create, to generate heat. And somebody also asked about, you know, is the asparagus uncovered for the winter? Um, uh, the asparagus is like a perennial, like, um, oh, like echinacea or um, uh, salvia, just any kind of perennial garden plant that dies back uh, in the winter time. So, um, so yeah, I, they're not covered at all. They're just, they're just the just a perennial <laughs> that happens to be a vegetable. So. You can still mulch around it, but you don't oh, have you to do yeah. the same, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I think that might be, because I, I don't have asparagus, but I've seen a lot of it mulched and then it kind of shoots up through the mulch. And I'm guessing mm -hmm. that would get you asparagus earlier, right? Versus yeah, not having that. mulch on it would be a little bit longer later on in the spring. I... I don't know about that. Um, I tend not to mulch until the general temperature has warmed up because I've found that if I mulch too early, it holds the coolness in the ground, which in some cases, maybe I want to do that, but usually I'm trying to rush things along and getting mm -hmm. things warmer. So uh, um, let's see, somebody asked if asparagus does okay in a raised bed. I think so, but why don't you Google that? Go Google and asparagus and raised bed and find out your answer. But or you I, could go to the Sawtooth Botanical Garden. There's some um, very old asparagus plants in the um, uh, education beds in the back that have been there. I don't know how long they've been there, but um, they do really, really well there. Um, did I have to start watering it early? Not any earlier than, you know, watching out for any other plants that are perennials that are coming along. So um, if there's been snow and the snow melting uh, generates the water it needs. But if you have a dry winter without snow, you may, you may have to. Great, thanks. I'm gonna have asparagus for dinner tonight. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you so much, Kristen. That was very inspiring. Mm -hmm. Thank you for hosting this series 
online on Zoom. I just wanted to mention that um, the Haley Public Library and the Wood River Seed Library partner to host the Seed Library at the Haley Library. <laughs> A lot of library stuff. So mm -hmm. thanks, everybody. We'll uh, I'll be sending out that um, uh, follow-up email and with all these links that we've had um, tonight. And thank you so very much for um, coming and happy gardening and happy spring. <laughs>